Hi, this is James and welcome to my channel and my first video where I'm going to start the process of building an 8-bit CPU. I've been watching some uh, other YouTubers, um, Ben Eater and Julian Illit most notably, and they've been uh, making a few uh, processor circuits which uh, I found very engrossing and I'd like to give it a try myself. Um, I'm generally thinking around the problem and I think I've got a, a few interesting things I'd like to try out that uh, um, take things in a different direction than they've done. They've very much been uh, trying to build very minimal, simple processes and I'd like to build something that, uh, that I can run some more complicated programs on. So here's the block diagram of what I'm planning. Now, most significantly over here, I've got 16-bit uh, address registers. This is because I'd like to be able to access um, quite a bit more memory. Um, this would give me the ability to address 64 kilobytes, which um, I mean I would have as a split of RAM and ROM. I don't know what the divide would be just yet. But uh, my main working registers would be um, a series of 8-bit general purpose registers. Now, the 16-bit address registers are a little bit of a problem because my ALU and everything else about the processor will be purely 8 bits. So the additional thing I'll have will be this uh, transfer register. And what that's going to do is it has the ability to work as both a 16-bit and a pair of 8-bit registers. So I can do a series of operations load them into the, the two 8-bit registers here and then move them from the transfer register into one of the 16-bit address registers and then uh, we can move around the whole of memory. Now most notably I'm going to have a pipeline. Now if you look at the uh, other processor designs that you see done on uh, breadboards what you most commonly see is uh, a very simple loop structure where the instruction is read in and then it follows through a number of steps loading from memory performing the operations storing in a register um, and then it moves back to the fetch stage before it moves on to the next instruction now pipelines are different than that um, what you have is a, a number of steps and the instruction will move down those steps as new instructions are fed in at the front. So whilst the uh, order of operations is very simple, in the first stage you'll fetch the instruction and then you'll move on doing uh, a succession of operations until it's complete. As an instruction moves on for the next one, you hopefully fetch an, a fresh instruction into the first stage. And this way you get um, multiple instructions executing concurrently and hopefully you move upwards to uh, a point where you've uh, you've got an awful lot more throughput um, from your CPU. So this is the bit I'm, uh, I'm really quite excited about uh, playing with but I've got a long way to go before I get there. Um, one question that uh, a few people have immediately had when I've uh, been describing this to them is uh, doesn't the 16-bit registers, doesn't that make it a 16-bit CPU and not an 8-bit CPU? Well the question to that is, um, or the answer to that is, is not really. Um, when we talk about an 8-bit CPU you're talking about 8-bit computation. So the general purpose registers here are 8 bits, the arithmetic and logic unit is going to work on things in 8 bit quantities, so it's really an 8 bit CPU. Just having some 16 bit registers doesn't make it 16 bit um, because we're, uh, we're programmers and we're not the marketing department of a 1990s uh, console manufacturer. Now, up here in the corner is the clock. A tiny bit, um, fairly insignificant, but it's what I've built. So I've got the little blue flash here of a power on reset. I've got the single step operation and 
I can uh, switch it into running and adjust the speed of it. Slightly dodgy contact on the potentiometer. But uh, the remainder of this video is, uh, is me building this. I actually did that last night and recorded it, but uh, I, uh, I messed up the audio recording on the introduction, so uh, I'm, I'm redoing that now. But uh, I, uh, I hope you find it interesting. Cheers. Goodbye. So, got to start somewhere. Um, empty breadboard. First thing I always look at is uh, which way round I've got it. Um, obviously by convention you've got the, these red and blue lines which uh, you use for power. And uh, I have, uh, I bought a few of these breadboards a little while ago and then started messing around with them. And uh, they look an awful lot um, very similar each way. And uh, I've wired a up a couple of circuits with it the wrong way around. The broken lines here are interesting because uh, they show that these buses uh, are split in the middle. You can get them without that, but uh, these cheaper ones I've got are split. So uh, first thing I do is uh, is bridge these connections over so I can uh, connect power up. You do feel quite silly when you uh, plug your power into one side, start building the circuit on the left and uh, and discover nothing's working. So the first thing I'm going to build is uh, is a clock circuit. Now. I don't want to go into too much details on the, the way the 555 timer works, partially because other people have done that an awful lot better than I can. So uh, here's a little 555 IC. Now one thing that uh, I have learned to be careful about is, uh, is where you put a chip down on the, the breadboard. You get these little gaps in the, in the power rails. So I try and position uh, my chip so uh, the, the pins that I know I'm going to need to connect to uh, to ground or power are uh, away from these gaps so I'm, I can keep the, the lines nice and straight. So I need to uh, get a quick reminder of the, uh, the wiring on a 555. Okay, so Got the ground is over on pin one here. Of course, you you should be careful to uh, to note where you're putting the little notch, so you know where uh, where the pin numbering starts. I find myself uh, spending half the time when messing around with electronics, just uh, just cutting small wires to, uh, to 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 try and neaten things up. You've probably seen this before. The uh, bridging wire here if you mess around with 555 timers you'll find yourself cutting a few of these uh, wires that connect to uh, pin 2 and pin 6 so this is the uh, the trigger line and the threshold line because uh, we're, we're programming this into an oscillating state so uh, these need to be tied together. I'm going to connect the, uh, the reset line high while I'm here. I know a lot of people don't do this. The main timing on the 555 is, uh, is governed by a capacitor here between the trigger line and ground. Okay, does this one go between ground or 5 volts? I need to consider my circuit here. Obviously what you have here is a pair of uh, resistors normally that are um, uh, 
charging and discharging the uh, the capacitor. Um, I think this goes into the five volt line. to go between the threshold line and the discharge. Okay, I think we're close to what we need there. We're going to want an LED for the output. worth remembering whether or not you're uh, interested in the LED coming on for an active high or an active low. It's uh, a mistake I often make. Let's get some power. It's always reassuring to see an LED come on got a resistor in line with it there so it doesn't get uh, too insane but um, okay so I think I've got everything I need there for this to be oscillating but I need to uh, need to actually pull my signal out okay that's not working what am I missing Was I right about that wanting to be grounded? Ah, hang on. I've stuck this resistor in the wrong place. Let's uh, simplify this down a little bit. I'm going to come across here. Discover I was right the first time with that. Bingo. Okay, so now we've uh, successfully demonstrated just how out of my depth I am. Let's uh, see if we can extend this a little bit. Um, in Ben's computer design, he uh, went on and, and built quite a complicated clock with uh, various modes. And uh, but what I'm going to do now is uh, is based a lot more on uh, what Julian had done, um, which I thought was a, a more compact way of doing it. Um, okay, before we go on, I'm going to stick this capacitor in here, uh, which is the one people recommend. So now, let's see if we can add some manual stepping in there. Right. You should be aware that uh, the 555 timer, um, what this is doing is it's uh, charging this capacitor until it hits the uh, lower threshold at what point the the signal comes on um, and then it continues to charge until it hits the upper threshold then the discharge line is uh, is raised and um, then the capacitor starts to discharge back through um, I believe that resistor um, and uh, and the cycle completes so what we're going to do is try and st stop the clock so we can do some manual manipulation of it 
by clamping the capacitor. So if I start with this, if I take this capacitor and I connect the other side to ground, the clock is stopping. If I connect it to uh, 5 volts, it stays off. So we can stop it in either side. The um, reason for this is obviously we're completely short circuiting the, uh, the mechanic which is uh, charging and discharging the circuit or the capacitor. So if I get a switch and I just need to remember which way the wires work on this. I believe that would then allow me to stop and start the clock. That's not terribly useful though, so and I don't think this is particularly safe putting it hard onto the rail, but um, what I can then do is take a switch here and uh, make it a little bit more adaptive. So this micro switch has um, normally closed and normally open contacts, so I can okay, I need to push it in the other direction as well. There we go. So I've got a clock that runs quite comfortably and I can stop it and fire it. That's cool. Nice single step. Um, okay, uh, variable speed, that'd be good. Um, okay, so what we're going to do here is replace one of these resistors with a variable resistor. Now, this is a standard variable resistor, but what I have done is I've soldered in these extra terminals at the back. Now, they just connect to the same terminals, but uh, what I have found is that these terminals at the front on these ones are very flimsy, so this gives it a little bit of extra support on the breadboard. Okay, so varying the speed as we'd ex expect. That's cool. Um, I think I'm going to try and find a smaller resistor just so that the fastest speed we get is, uh, is a little bit more interesting. This is an operation I should have done before I stuck that in. That's better. All right, that's pretty cool. Okay, so um, what else can we do? Um, well, I'm interested in having an inverted clock as well. So let's see how we can get that. So add another LED for it.
and another resistor. So obviously we can tie that straight into the same line and get the same clocking sequence, but I'd, uh, I'd like to get it inverted. So we need an inverter chip and a pretty simple one is one of these 74LS04s. If we have a look at the uh, circuit diagram for that, this is a pretty classic chip. It's got the uh, VCC and ground on the opposite corners and it's got six of these uh, inverter gates. Let's get that in, noting where our uh, pin one is. Um, hook in VCC to the 5 volt line hooking ground to the wrong space let's try it over here instead I do have a very bad habit of actually working on circuit boards with the power on um, I don't recommend you do that but I find it more interesting. Okay, so let's look back here. We've got six of these inverters. We can use whichever ones we want. Um, so closest one to uh, where our signal is is over here on pins one and two. Let's find a couple of wires. So all we really need to do here is take our... Uh, Let's take it from over there so we can keep things neat around the LEDs. So then we go to the input on pin one. On pin two, that comes out and goes in here, and suddenly we've got our inverted clock. Nice. That's actually going to be quite handy when we get to some of the later circuits where uh, you, uh, you're interested in. Uh, the clock being active high or, or active low in different places. Now, could leave it here, but um, I have noticed one phenomena on this circuit which I don't like. If I stop the clock, take the power down, and then put the power back on, the clock line goes high. It's not that big a deal, but um, I'd be interested to see how we could solve that. I'm not 100% sure why it happens. Um, as it's probably pretty obvious, the, um, the analog electronic components um, on partial portion of the circuit, circuitry is something I'm not all that familiar with. But uh, digital side of things I can uh, I can see fairly well and what I do know is the kind of set reset latch that's inside a 555 um, will often be in a very um, indetermined state um, you get a race condition and the the the, the Q or um, inverse Q will be high when you when you first power them up now the, this particular problem could be Anything in the analog circuitry, maybe a voltage spike um, that, that causes it to, to trip, but it could be this uh, set reset latch um, issue that I've described. But either way, we've got this line down here, which is a, a reset line. So if I take that out and I replace it with a pull down resistor. Sorry, a pull up resistor. It's, uh, it's active low, this one. Um, take my power out and bring it low and bring the power back on. The glitch doesn't happen. My circuit doesn't work, um, but the glitch doesn't happen. So what we need to do is work out a way of of doing that electronically. 
So really interesting way of doing it is we could use exactly the same phenomena. We could duplicate the relevant portions of this circuit and what we do know is when we first apply power to the 555 timer in this configuration we get a little pulse out of it. So we could take that pulse, put it for an inverter, pump it into the reset line of this one and hopefully that would actually work. Um, but I was actually looking around online at, uh, at various different solutions to, to this particular problem. Um, I know other people do things with a, a resistor capacitor circuit to, uh, to, to get the, the line low just temporarily at power up. But um, I did find this one chip which had a few interesting properties. This is the LP3470 voltage supervisor which uh, is basically designed for generating these reset signals. So as the circuits cascade out and we've got more and more complexity, we're going to have more and more things which are in an indetermined state when we turn them on. So we want this reset line. So first off, I'm going to add another LED to the circuit to, uh, to show our reset line. Actually, learnt these five, these uh, blue LEDs are a bit brighter than the others, so I'm using a uh, slightly higher value resistor here. But uh, let's double check I've wired that up correctly. That's right. A number of times I've sat there trying to debug a circuit and only to discover that the LED was around the wrong way. Um, probably shouldn't admit to that. Okay, so let's go back. Let's look at this LP3470. Um, what it does is it, it monitors the voltage level and when the voltage level is too low, it will generate the reset signal. And of course this works when it's powering on because uh, the, the voltage level starts off at zero. Now, one problem is these chips I can only find them in a surface mount pack. So uh, I did manage to get one of these uh, tiny circuit boards for connecting um, the surface mount chips back to uh, a, a dip type pin arrangement. And I had my very first experience of uh, soldering a surface mount Let's see if it works. So, I don't know about you or the camera, but I cannot see where the uh, the, the one pin is there. But I do know that uh, it's on the opposite side to where this uh, missing pin on the five pin package is. Let's get it over there. Okay, so let's see how we have to wire it up. Right, now this is a weird one. VCC1 always connect to pin VCC, pin 4. So that's pin 3 and 4 need to always be connected together. Whenever I see things like this, I'm always uh, assuming that there must be some reason why uh, they don't just do that inside the IC. Okay, why is a little bit awkward here? So. Okay, I had a small problem there where the uh, phone stopped uh, recording video, but uh, anyway, we've got our chip in place here. Now we need to give it some power. The invention always seems to be to uh, to bring power in from the top where you can. So I'm going to connect it to that one, although obviously I could have connected it to either side of this uh, connection between the two VCC lines. And the ground comes in at the middle pin at the bottom. 
that's good. And then I need to put a capacitor in to um, set the, the reset timeout. I did have a little bit of a play with this device before, so I've basically picked one from my capacitor tray which uh, produced a reasonable signal. But okay, so this should be capable of doing something. So if I grab a wire here and connect that between this reset output and let's take that one out. Plug that in there. This should be uh, operating. So that still works. Let's uh, disconnect the power and see what happens. Ah! So none of that. Uh, flash on the red line and that all still works okay so let's, um, let's have a look at this so if I connect the reset line up to my LED it stays on because this is a an active low line but we do have lots more of these inverters on the logic chip over here. So if I pass the signal through one of these, which you know it's going to be that one and that one, we can actually see the reset. Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay, so disconnect the power, connect it up, and we see a little flash on the blue LED to show the reset lines going uh, low, well, low in the uh, input to the rest of the circuit. That's not right. That's pretty, but it's not right. Um, the reset line, the blue LED should stay off. Okay, I've got a thought on what's going on here. Let's, uh, let's do this. Okay, now I just saw a little flash on the reset line there, and I've got a theory about what's happening. Um, when we first connect this capacitor, it's going to start charging and it's going to drain comparatively a large amount of current um, which is going to momentarily cause the voltage level to drop and if we uh, look back at the title of this chip it is a voltage supervisor so what it does is it as well as providing that reset signal or power up is it's monitoring the voltage line and if it sees the voltage line drop too low it puts out its reset signal so this capacitor is uh, stabilizing the power line. Um, so what was happening was whenever I clocked it, the circuits were switching, um, draining a small amount of power out of the circuit and uh, causing the voltage level to drop. Now, I think that's uh, one of the things that, that trips people up with uh, larger circuits so um, I'm hoping that this little chap here is going to uh, operate as a canary to uh, to tell me when I'm starting to see low voltage levels on the circuit before the circuit starts behaving oddly so there we have it reset works single stepping works and we have adjustable speed. I'm going to call it a day there. Next time you see this I will have uh, neatened up some of these wires.